sounds of life. I'm eating an apple and I'm putzing about the house, as my friend would say. It's a very good apple. Picked it at the beginning of fall at an orchard just outside of Cambridge, Ontario. It's delicious. I've had it in our workshop, our cold workshop in the basement. But let's get started. So welcome to Blithering Thoughts at the Hopeful Humanist Cafe. Today we're going to talk about a decent flow of the good life and resources for our spiritual toolbox. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about is going to relate to a t-shirt idea notion. I think I got in there a novel first sentence and uh, we got some etc. moment stuff. It's been a while since my last episode and and not by choice, not by choice at all. Uh, my absence has been the result of uh, something that I just wanted to make a little bit of a footnote, a side note, just share the thought and then uh, move forward. So, but uh, in the future, perhaps uh, this uh, side note footnote will probably manifest itself in a full length episode. But currently I'm in the process of recovering from a concussion. So there's a lot of things that drain my tank. Things that get me empty pretty quick include talking, thinking, driving, just filtering things that are going on, lots of stimulus in my environment, processing all that stimuli, multitasking, physical activities, and analyzing things. So I've been spending most of my time doing the things that uh, fill up the gas tank sleeping, well, attempting to sleep, resting the brain, relaxation techniques like yoga, switching tasks, doing something for a short period, and then resting, and then doing something else. Lots of planning and uh, always considering the pace of things. But I thought that it could be helpful in terms of my recovery to do an episode. And uh, so I got some things together, some thoughts together, and, uh, you know, as always, this is going to be like a non sequitur moment where a lot of these thoughts are just uh, thrown in and stirred around like a soup, stirred around like a soup. Um, so I'll start with a, a quote that I think kind of fits with uh, my situation. And I, and I think a lot of people um, are struggling, uh, dealing with stress, uh, up against deadlines. Uh, one, it's one thing or another. So the quote comes from uh, goodreads.com it's from winston churchill and it's uh, it goes as such never 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 give up now i've come across a number of iterations of uh, this quotation and i think uh, in, in a couple of them the the never has uh, spanned uh, about nine to eleven nevers I actually like that, uh, the one that includes 11 nevers, because you, you just get a real sense of persistence. You're like, you know, no, this person, they've got focus. This, this person, Winston Churchill, he's got focus and he's going to, he's not going to veer from uh, his eye being on the prize. So that is our, our thought for the day. Never, 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 never give up. I thought uh, since it's been a while, we could probably include a word for the day. So I uh, got uh, from the Oxford dictionaries. Um, blether, not, not blither, but blether. So blether is a long-winded talk with no real substance and it's going to kind of connect with uh, my discussion about a sitcom that's no longer on the air that claimed to have to do everything 
about nothing. And some people might already have a heads up about what that uh, that sitcom might be. So um, today we're going to uh, blether about some trite stuff because you know what? Life doesn't always need to be so heavy. So the uh, the t-shirt notion for today uh, there's, uh, you know, we have some friends, uh, different families. We talk in, in terms of being parents and supporting our, our, our young ones, our children, and they go through different things. And uh, in, in this one situation, there's a little one that um, struggles with uh, some pronunciation uh, in terms of words. And, you know, for some, uh, it, they struggle with the owls and others maybe with the uh, the THs. And in, in this case... Uh, the, the TH, instead of say, you know, necessarily, necessarily saying something like uh, think, um, because of rushing, it would be, um, you know, well, that's not what I think, right? And so um, one of the exercises that this young one has in terms of going to a uh, speech therapist is practicing the, this sequence of uh, words, this, that, there. And and I, I found that really interesting. I was like, this is this is actually quite fun. This that there, I thought this could be a great shirt, a great uh, uh, logo, a great uh, idea for a shirt. One on top of the other. This, that there, and we could turn it into a game. And so because the blithering thoughts about t-shirt ideas and. Uh, First sentence, novel first sentence, and et cetera. Moments is about creativity, fostering creativity, nourishing creativity. I thought, okay, well, let's imagine that uh, this is a shirt that we're all wearing. You've got on yours, I've got on mine, this, that, there. And we're passing by someone on the street, and they're like, hey, cool shirt. And you're like, yeah, it's a game, this, that, there. You're like, well, what's that game all about? Well, you have to make a sentence. And uh, the sentence has to include those three words in that particular order. Uh, so uh, the two examples that I have, I mean, they're, they're kind of similar. But I, I, I shared this thought with some friends and they came up with some really good ones. And I just uh, didn't have the time to, uh, to write them down. But uh, my first one was, you know, if you're kind of being a little cheeky uh, with someone, you could be saying, you know, this conversation uh, that we're having, eh, it just ain't there for me. Uh, but I kind of uh, morphed it a little bit and, and related to the fact that I'm uh, trying to stand up to this concussion. And uh, so th this is the what I've come up with. In this episode that I'm currently creating, there's going to be reference to a lot of trite stuff. The perfect medicine for a concussed brain. This, that, there. So what do you got? Do you got something playful that you could throw out there? Maybe tonight when you're sitting around the dinner table, gathered as a family, something that we should be doing, spending time together, talking about our days. It's a protective factor. Um, maybe uh, have a this, that, there challenge, a this, that, there competition. So uh, knowing that this episode is you know just uh, going to be about blethering trite stuff kind of just like a neighborly moment uh, for me in a, in a sense to kind of get out of my head um, I wanted to share that one of the things that's helped me when I've had some of uh, my very difficult moments is uh, instead of reading you know like I can't read hurts my eyes can't go on screens can't you know watch tv you know, the blue light, once again, it's not good for my eyes. And so, you know, w w what can you do? In, in many ways, uh, recovery is quite boring. But um, I decided that I was going to go and uh, find, go through my uh, DVD sets and, and find a set that I'm really familiar with so that I, I don't feel like I'm losing anything by not being able to watch it. And just, you know, listen along as uh, this DVD is playing itself out. And so... I, I found Seinfeld, and I just very much enjoy Seinfeld. And Seinfeld apparently is a show about nothing. Uh, some people say it's a nihilistic show, 
But for me, I think uh, while there's a lot of truth in that, it's also a, a show about um, absurdity. And it really captures a lot of those um, mundane, nuanced, absurd moments that uh, many of us uh, can relate to. So I was listening to a number of uh, different episodes and uh, you know, when I, one night when I was getting ready for bed, I was like, okay, well, I can't read. So maybe I'm going to go on the tablet and uh, have my wife set it up so that I can have uh, access to an audio book. And when I went to our local library using the Libby um, app, I discovered that there was this book. Well, there was two books. So like uh, talk about serendipitous, right? The first book was called Seinfeldia by Jennifer K. Armstrong, which, you know, I very much enjoyed. It talks about the whole history of uh, Seinfeld. But there's another book uh, called Festivus. Festivus, the holiday for the rest of us by Alan Salkin and a foreword by uh, Jerry Stiller. And this book is about a particular episode. Well, it relates to a particular episode of Seinfeld, but it, it, it goes beyond it in terms of giving the, the history of this thing called Festivus. But uh, in 1997, I believe on December 18th, they aired an episode on Seinfeld called The Strike, and in it there was a secondary story about a character, Frank, um, uh, George Costanza's father, uh, wants to s celebrate this this holiday that he invented called Festivus. And uh, this 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 book goes on to kind of identify that Festivus was not actually created on that particular episode. That uh, one of the uh, scriptwriters. I think his name was uh, Daniel Jr. O'Keefe. Well, I guess his father in 1966, Daniel Sr. O'Keefe, um, wanted to kind of capture in a, uh, a celebratory way uh, the first date that he had with his wife, and he came up with this idea of Festivus. And that over the years, it kind of morphed. It, it, it had a number of unorthodox uh, rituals, um, it, it was about capturing the, the organic reality of their particular family. Well, this young, uh, his youngest son, Daniel Keith's son, uh, Daniel Jr., he became a screenwriter, uh, a scriptwriter at Jerry Seinfeld's uh, production of Seinfeld. And they incorporated this idea of Festivus, kind of uh, anti-commercial celebration for I guess you could say the secular some you know listening to uh, the the audiobook uh, there's one suggestion that it's kind of like a postmodern tradition that has evolved in response to the kind of commercialism that has grabbed hold of uh, these holidays um, and 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 move them away from the their, you know, their initial reasons for being the raison de, how would you say that? Raison de, re, de être, raison de être, yeah, the reason for being. And uh, I, I just, I just became really interested in uh, and, and distracted from some of the stuff that was going on because of this uh, festivist idea. It just became really, really interesting. So, um, the idea is that it, in the book is they're not suggesting that this is supposed to replace by any means um, these different festive occasions uh, that people are enjoying and celebrating for very meaningful ways. But it's it, maybe it could be an in, in addition holiday um, that, that it's a holiday of choice and it's kind of like an, an, an antidote to the commercialism um, of some of the ways in which the holidays are being co-opted by, by uh, you know, um, the idea that things uh, have to be bought, the gifts have to be bought and given. So it's a, it's a post 
modern evented tradition holiday. And, and let me say right off the bat, I, I, I agree, Festivus is not for everyone, and I'm not suggesting that uh, everyone pick it up as uh, something to introduce into um, your, your family and, and to, to celebrate. No, I, I just thought it would be a really interesting kind of creative um, opportunity to explore uh, the thought about if we were, if one was, to decide to start celebrating Festivus, this anti-commercial, um, postmodern, invented tradition. The, the exciting thing about it is it's encouraging people to kind of claim it, take it, and make it their own. And that's what I find exciting in terms of like, just like a, a, a thought experiment. So in terms of uh, this thought experiment, knowing that uh, the, the episode as it, it, it aired in 1997, introduce uh, Festivus, a holiday for the rest of us, um, you know, this kind of secular experience, uh, a holiday for everyone. It, it talked about uh, the idea that there's no gift giving. There's a pole, just an aluminum pole, an unadorned aluminum pole without tinsel. <laughs> that uh, you would put in the center of the room and that would be the the essence of capital you know capitalizing or capturing the minimalist kind of stance that it, it, it's attempting to embrace right and that uh, there would be a gathering of uh, family and friends and then they have this thing called the air, uh, the airing of grievances in the episode and feats of strength now I like the idea of having uh, an additional holiday as an antidote to the commercialization of these other sacred holidays. Just as a kind of a reminder, a mental kind of uh, holding oneself accountable and saying, you know what, like if we're getting in debt for Christmas, if, if you know, we're making it all about the gifts and we're getting stressed out in the process, then maybe we're missing the point because the real point I think of a lot of these holidays, um, the, the common ground, if, if we move away from the, the religious uh, aspect of whatever holiday we might be talking about, is that it's about togetherness, it's about family, it's about good food, it's about laughing, it's about celebrating, perhaps for some it might be about um, dancing, and that that is, is the thing that, that I would want to capture. And uh, so in the episode, when it refers to this idea of earring of grievances, <laughs> so it's, you could picture if you go to the episode, I'll try to put a couple of links on YouTube. I don't think I could get the whole episode uh, and, and provide a link to that, but a couple of segments, and I'm gonna need some um, help um, from my beautiful wife to do that uh, because I'm trying to minimize my time on the screen. But um, when, when, when you watch the episode, there's a point where uh, the idea of the airing of grievances is that you, the people that collected are collected uh, and have come together, you tell them how they have disappointed you over the year. <laughs> now, you know, for me, that's something that would be, have, to, have to be tweaked. Uh, the other one is feats of strength, where I guess uh, in, in terms of uh, Daniel O'Keefe, um, when he was a uh, junior, when he was younger, him and his brothers on this day would... You know, they would wrestle with each other, which is, you know, not uh, play, uh, playful wrestling is, is something that, you know, kind of makes sense that uh, um, some little boys and little girls uh, would want to do. But I'm, I'm imagining um, that this wouldn't be a centerpiece in my thought experiment. In my thought experiment, um, I imagine, and, and that's what, what this is all about, right? We're just trying to be creative. And I, and I want, I, I'm inviting you as a thought experiment to imagine that you are the planner, the holiday planner for Festivus. Now, uh, in the episode, it usually takes place on, uh, it's suggested that it takes place on the 23rd. But in, in my imagining of whatever this thing Festivus might be, it happens whenever you can have your friends come together and assemble with one another and share company in, in a way that's not stressful and it doesn't put anyone out and someone doesn't have to uh, rush away from their their uh, work shift and you know 
an hour later try to get dressed and make their appearance and just feel exhausted no it's like it's it's a, a time that works for everyone and instead of the aluminum pole there would be a a coat rack a wooden coat rack that would be in the center of the room and when people arrive to you know to kind of capture this this the sense that the the celebration is starting everyone would be putting their coats on top of the coat rack and it would flesh itself out and fill itself out and it would kind of like almost metaphorically be a uh, parallel to to the christmas tree and it would be saying that you know all these people have come here and assembled at a time that is wonderful for everyone to share in laughter and good conversation and good food and that we would know that the celebration has come to its conclusion when all the coats have left the hook and the the coat rack is empty uh, in terms of this idea of airing of grievances you know i guess there's first of a question could there be some benefits to uh, an opportunity when people come together to start airing their grievances and telling one another how you've disappointed each other over the year i don't know i guess perhaps there that could be cathartic but uh, for me i i think i would and the happiness research indicates like that this really does make a difference in in terms of uh, well-being uh, good mental health elevated levels of happiness I, i'd like to do um, a moment of gratitude you know where you go around and you you maybe identify um how uh, specifically you feel um, grateful for your friends, the things that they've done for you, um, things that have happened over the year. I guess if you were going to do an airing of grievances, one thing could be, maybe it could be the idea of putting something, being sharing that you're glad something's behind. For instance, at some point it would be nice for me to be able to share and say, yeah, I'm glad my concussion's behind me. I'm glad that I'm me again. Um, or it could be uh, a different iteration, uh, could be the idea of sharing things that we are proud of uh, that we've accomplished over the year and, and, and sharing that and celebrating that with one another. Um, so for me, that would be a huge um, tweak. Uh, now, in terms of the feats of strength, um, I, 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 I can't say that <laughs> I would get excited about people wrestling and rolling around and knocking things over and people accidentally getting hurt and someone possibly getting a concussion. <laughs> um, but but what I, there are different variations of that. There's a game that I really very much enjoy playing. I think it really fosters creativity. And I, I have shared before the name of the game is called Codename Pictures or Codename Words. And I, I think uh, you could do the uh, feats of strength and, and transform it into uh, feats of... Um, mental strength or mental uh, creativity and uh, you just have a game of code names where you, you break up into two teams and you just have fun um, creatively coming up with words to uh, have your teammates pick the cards that match with um, the map that you've been designated in terms of what cards belong to your team as opposed to what cards belong to the other team the other idea i had as a, a feat of strength would literally be, you know, um, feet, F-E-E-T, and that, uh, you know, every you ask everyone to get together at a certain point and say, okay, we're going to do the yoga pose, um, the tree pose, and uh, everyone stands on one leg, you know, uh, you're supporting yourself with one foot, <laughs> and uh, you're either collectively just holding the pose for 30 seconds and creating a forest of friendliness, or uh, you're having a, a competition where you can see who can uh, hold the pose the longest. And that, that literally would be, you know, feats of strength. Um, uh, so that's, that's my thought of how you could kind of take some of the ideas there and uh, make, it, make it your own and, and just have some fun as a, as a thought experiment. Um, there is, there's another thing I, I think I would look forward to. Uh, in terms of this bare minimum celebration where, uh, you know, uh, family and friends coming together and, uh, you know, sharing um, 
laughter and company and, and togetherness. And it would be that at some point that uh, someone yells out, it's a Festivus miracle. So my understanding of a Festivus miracle is the, the idea when something completely explainable <laughs> prevents itself, uh, presents itself. Um, and then someone, but it's, it, it's, it's something that's uh, um, positive and enjoyable that someone would yell out. It's a, it's a festive miracle. And um, I, I'm not imagining right now uh, what that would be. I, I guess I struggle a little bit with that one. But uh, what do you think? What, what do you think could be a commonplace expected experience that would just be uh, really fun to uh, play out and then someone's able to yell and it's a festive miracle so there you go uh, in terms of uh, this episode I, I just really wanted to explore uh, the the possible ways of tweaking the uh, festivus celebration that seemed to have uh, it seems to have basically been given birth with the uh, the beginning of uh, the airing of that episode uh, on Seinfeld on December 19th. But if you do get the the uh, Festivus book, they suggest that actually it's got a long history, over 2,200 years, and it's had many incarnations. It's a very populist um, experience, and that it just, it just, it's about people coming together and feeling grateful that they got through another year. Uh, the sentence... I would like to end with in terms of uh, novel first sentences it goes like this and and I, I think it kind of it falls under this category of human hubris and and that's all I'll say it happened it was never supposed to happen to me I was never supposed to be in the other chair. Okay, there's a, a novel first sentence, and uh, I guess I'd just like to end by I, I sharing an article that uh, was brought to my attention on uh, CBC Radio. So it's a, a short podcast, and uh, it's about this gentleman named John Richards, and uh, it it's in relationship to. Uh, my, my title is called The Apostrophe's Demise. <laughs> and notice that uh, apostrophes, uh, in this case, has an apostrophe S uh, in terms of its demise. And uh, John Richards, he was the founder um, and uh, the person that ran the Apostrophe Protection Society for 18 years. And uh, his goal was to educate people about the importance of the apostrophe. But he's shutting down. He's shutting down his organization. He's 96 years old. And he said he's tapping out uh, at this point. And he believes that uh, the cause of uh, the situation, he's blaming the, the, the lack of the appreciation for the apostrophe to um, ignorance and laziness and uh, so it looks like that punctuation mark is falling out of favor now I just find that interesting that uh, in terms of uh, language there there is an evolution and uh, I guess at you know um, some people are, are, are possibly thinking that uh, the question mark uh, the uh, the apostrophe is trite it's a trite punctuation mark. Um, my 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 theory is so here you know once again let's be creative and what are theories? Why why would people be casting aside the apostrophe? What would be ex what would be an explanation of the apostrophe's demise? And my thought is that uh, we live in a world where everything is fast paced. And we're we're multitasking, and and that's one of the challenges I have with uh, my my concussion, right? Like multitasking increases my symptoms. But this is the world we live in. It's a it's a fast paced world. It's often described as us uh, existing on 
the hedonic treadmill, you know, in a world that is uh, moving at uh, it's it's a rat race, and there's 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 so much to do, and we've got access to one another and all this information at our fingertips, and it seems like there's just not enough time to uh, <clears throat> reach over and make a couple button pushes and get that apostrophe in there. It just seems like that's going to slow things down and there's not enough time for it. Um, that's my thought. What do you think? Well, thank you for joining me in a much needed episode of the Hopeful Humanist Cafe, Blithering Thoughts at the Hopeful Humanist Cafe. Just a blethering moment of triteness and uh, just having a neighborly a neighbor, a neighborly time. So I, I, I wish you well. I wish you creativity. And uh, in the words of uh, Winston Churchill, whatever you're up against, um, never, 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 never give up.